Before we get started, I want to thank our major sponsor, uh, Build Equinox. Um, and I wanted to just uh, remind everybody of a product that they have, uh, the CERV, especially in the context of what we're talking about at this session in regards to uh, building health, uh, comfort, um, and reduce pollutants. This is an advanced uh, energy recovery or heat recovery system that's actually made right in the Chicagoland area in a, in a manufactured in a, in, a, in, a, in a setting that's 100% solar powered, so very cool. It's a system uh, that uh, acts as one of the most efficient uh, ERV type systems out on the market, uh, as well as has the ability to monitor uh, pollutants in the air, such as formaldehyde, uh, COs if you're having a big party, um, even uh, even uh, TVOCs and VOCs and be able to uh, ramp up to the appropriate level to remove those pollutants uh, rather than over ventilating the house. Not only that, but it has an application that you can attach for a mini heat pump. And there are even some projects that are building so energy efficient and tight that they claim even in cold weather climates that the small heat pump attached to this system can heat and cool the house without any other supplemental exhaust. So check them out over at buildequinox.com and reach out to learn more about the serve today. All right, so with that, I'm very excited about our uh, webinar here today, uh, Building Economics, the Holistic Impact of Working in a Green Certified Building on Cognitive Function and Health. This course is approved for one hour in continuing education, GVCI, AIA, HSW, AIBD, Certified Green Professional, Nary Green and may be applicable to your local state based or design contractor license. Today I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little and I'm the executive director here at the Green Home Institute. The Green Home Institute is a nonprofit with a mission to make healthier and more sustainable choices in the renovation and construction of the places we live. So with that, I'm excited to uh, announce our uh, two speakers today. Uh, first, we have uh, Pierce uh, McNaughton. Uh, Dr. Pierce uh, is a Doctor of Science and Master of Science Project Manager at Harvard uh, T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Health. He is the Project Manager of the COD FX study, and his research focuses on the influence of the built environment and on health. And then second, who will be first kicking us off, is uh, Joseph Allen, Doctor of Science, Master of Public Health Assistant Professor at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. And he joined Harvard faculty in 2014 as, assist, as an assistant professor of exposure assessment science in the Department of Environmental Health at the Harvard T.H. Chan Public School. So with that, Joseph, I will hand it off to you and then we will be hearing from Pierce and they will both be with us to answer further questions from there. Thank you. Your study, looking at the impact of green buildings and green building design on an outcome that we think is of interest and has been understudied, and that is on cognitive function or decision-making performance. So I'm going to get underway. The presentation will probably be about 30 or 40 minutes. You'll hear from me, uh, then I'll pass it over to Piers for a little bit, and then we hope to leave plenty of time for question and answer and discussion, and we'll hold, uh, we'll address all the questions and answers at the end as we get through our presentation. Very often we find that we answer a lot of the questions uh, as they come up, just through our normal presentation. This work uh, is in collaboration with SUNY, uh, collaborators at SUNY Upstate Medical School and the Syracuse uh, Center of Excellence. And I want to acknowledge some of the uh, critical co-authors on this work. So uh, myself and peers are on the call today. We work with Dr. Usha Satish at SUNY Upstate Medical School and Dr. Jack Spangler, a uh, professor at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. We start our presentations by asking this question, why are we ignoring the 90%? We've been asking this question for over a year now, uh, and what we mean by this 90% is first, uh, we're ignoring where we spend most of our time. We spend 90% of our time indoors, right? I think uh, when you think of it this way, it's intuitive that the indoor environment has an outsized impact on our health, but it, Actually, I think it's often ignored. We uh, see reports of air pollution uh, in the newspapers daily. We very rarely see discussions about this indoor environment. 
we have a national ambient air quality standard. We don't really have, we don't have a, a national indoor air quality standard. Closest thing we have is to uh, legally enforceable limits on exposures to hazards indoors are the OSHA limits, and those are um, grossly outdated. We spend a lot of our time indoors. I turned, uh, you know, 40 last year, so I've spent 36 years of my life indoors. So take your age, multiply it by 0.9. That's how much time you're spending indoors. Uh, and yet we spend very little time talking about it. The other part of the 90% we're ignoring, ignoring is the true cost of operating building. So the green building movement has largely been chasing the 10% cost, right? We, we spend a lot of time and have spent a lot of time, rightly, thinking about energy efficiency, waste, water. The true cost of operating a building are the people inside. That's their salaries, their benefits, their overall health. And this, it turns out, is uh, we could think about these two 90% we're ignoring where people spend their time and the true cost of operating a building. This is where we see the, the biggest opportunity in the future for the green building movement is a focus on uh, human health outcomes. One of the key drivers and determinants of health in indoor environments is ventilation rate. And what you see here is a, a graph of uh, normalized leakage over 100 years. This is for U.S. homes, uh, essentially looking at ventilation or air exchange inside homes. And for most of the last century, we hovered about one air change per hour. If you look at ASHRAE right now, I think it's the uh, median air exchange rate is about 0.45 air changes per hour. Done measurements in new tightly constructed homes, you see air exchange rates at a 0 0.1, 0 0.2 air changes per hour. And the standard that governs this uh, largely for most indoor environments is ASHRAE 62.1, which sets the ventilation rates. Uh, and the past several decades, it's been trying to find this optimal balance between energy conservation and health. So there's this trade-off. We conserve energy or, or we uh, tightening up a building envelope so much that uh, we're decreasing performance. If you see on this graph a sharp downturn or sharp tightening, tightening of our em, uh, building envelopes occurred in the late 70s, early 80s. This is in response to the energy crisis uh, largely. And what you see, uh, I don't think surprisingly, is that at about that time you start to see these terms appearing in the peer-reviewed literature and also the uh, popular press, uh, sick building syndrome. So this uh, set of symptoms related to time spent in underperforming environments that importantly resolve when you leave those spaces, right? And so this term appears right as we're tightening up our building envelopes, and it's not uh, a coincidence. So we started asking a question about two years ago, so well, what about green buildings? They're designed to be uh, energy efficient, and there's been lots of research and papers and white papers and reports published on the impact of green buildings on energy conservation and water conservation. But we said, well, what about green buildings and health specifically? So we published a review paper uh, last year, or a year and a half ago now, that looked at the, the state of the science on green buildings and health. And it turns out there's only uh, a handful of papers published on this topic, maybe uh, under 20 papers. Largely, they show that green buildings uh, perform better in terms of indoor environmental quality across many parameters. Uh, and they also report that people's perceptions of the indoor environment are better. So people in green buildings report feeling better satisfaction with the air quality inside their space. Now, all these studies have some really important limitations, which we discussed in this paper, but mostly they have small sample sizes, and they nearly all rely on uh, subjective measures. So simply asking somebody, uh, how do you feel in this space? They rely on self-report, right, which from an epidemiological standpoint is, uh, and I think a common sense standpoint, is subject to information or uh, is subject to bias, right? So it has some problems. And we were thinking hard about how do we improve upon that methodology and think about what's the impact of green buildings on health, but importantly on a specific, what we call health performance indicator, and that's cognitive function or decision-making performance. And I use that word, health, the term health performance indicator. It's something we talk about in our papers where businesses report KPIs for key performance indicators, and we're encouraging 
uh, we want businesses to start thinking about HPIs or health performance indicators, be explicit about what they're tracking related to their building and workforce that's related to health, which is good for the employees and it's also uh, has been shown to be good for the bottom line in terms of uh, the economics of the business. So I'm trying to build upon that work and using this a, a more objective outcome measure, uh, this health performance indicator, and looking at cognitive function, we launched a study in 2015 looking at the impact of green buildings on cognitive function. And I'll talk about these results before uh, Piers talks about our latest study. The two are complementary, so it's worth, if you haven't heard this or seen the results, it's worth uh, talking through the first study because it's pretty unique. So the, the, uh, the picture you see on the screen now is an overview of our study design. And here's what we did. We, we enrolled 24 workers to spend six days with us over two weeks at the Syracuse Center of Excellence. And that's depicted in the picture on the top right there. So it's a typical office cubicle environment. And we asked these office workers to come do their normal work. So instead of showing up or wherever their office was, they showed up here to our study site, did their normal work, nine to five. We provided them with lunch. They stayed here all day. Um, but what was unique about this center is depicted in the floor below, uh, picture on the bottom right, is that from the floor below we could change different parameters in the indoor environment without the study participants knowing. So we could introduce and change their environment in subtle ways each day. So they came in uh, on day one and we had a certain setup in place uh, and then the second day we'd change it, third day we'd change it. So it was held constant for each day. Uh, and at the end of the day, we administered a cognitive function test, which I'll talk about in a minute. And the three parameters we really wanted to test in this first study were uh, to, we wanted to assess the impact of higher ventilation rates. So I talked about earlier the importance of ventilation for health, and, we, and that ASHRAE standard specifies for offices that you meet about 20 CFM per person, 20 cubic feet per minute per person. And we asked the question, what happens if we double that? Then we wanted to ask, well, what's the impact, direct impact of carbon dioxide on decision-making performance or cognitive function? Now, carbon dioxide is perfectly confounded or correlated with the ventilation rate. So in this study, what we did is we disentangled that and we introduced ultra-pure carbon dioxide to test the direct effect of CO2. And the last thing we wanted to test uh, was what's the effect of VOCs or volatile organic compounds. These are chemicals that are uh, in, in all sorts of building materials, personal care products, uh, they off-gas from carpets, and we introduced um, common sources of VOCs that you'd be found in an office environment, things like surface cleaners or uh, adhesives and even uh, fresh dry cleaning. And the big point of this study that I, I want to be sure comes across is that um, we tested non-exotic conditions, right? All of this is achievable in most, if not all, indoor spaces uh, right now. The study was a double-blinded study, meaning the participants didn't know what we were doing, and the analysts who analyzed the cognitive function data were not uh, <clears throat> aware of the conditions on each day. And the way we assess cognitive function is use this tool, this SMS tool that you see on the screen now. And it operates a little bit like uh, a game. At the end of the day, the participants play this game. And what they're doing is they're, they're immersed in a real-world scenarios. And we chose the tool for many reasons. First, it's been used for several decades. It's been used on tens of thousands of people. It's well validated. Uh, there were many studies published on it. And it's free form. It's not a finger tap test. It's not a memory test. It's actually designed to simulate real world decision making and the complexity of tasks we face in our office. I'll just quickly run through an example here. In this scenario, this person is a mayor of a town some, uh, where you see event messages. Things start happening in the town in real time. Uh, they have access to information across the top bar, and, and then on the right is their planning and decision area where they make plans and decisions related to events that are happening in their town. So we track their performance and we quantify uh, their performance across nine cognitive function domains. And here's what we saw in terms of the data. It was, it was striking. We saw a doubling of cognitive function scores for participants who spend time in this, what we call an enhanced green environment that's optimized for CO2, ventilation, and chemicals. So low chemicals, low CO2, high ventilation rate. So we see this quite dramatic effect on decision-making performance, again, at conditions that are uh, non-exotic, right? We can, we can achieve this in most indoor spaces uh, across the nine cognitive function domains where the biggest 
performance improvements or performance difference occurred in three domains, crisis response, information usage, and strategy. And in prior work, those are the three cognitive function domains in this tool that were most closely linked with productivity and salary. So in that study, we also wanted to see the impact of carbon dioxide independent of ventilation rate. And I'll show one of the nine domains here, but if you look at our papers and we can send out a link for it all. Uh, we basically, we see an impact of carbon dioxide uh, on decision-making performance. So here's one graph, across the x-axis is the carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide concentrations, outdoors 400 and rising. Uh, if you're meeting the ASHRAE standard, you can be at or below 950 parts per million. Most schools in the United States are around 1,400 to 1,600 parts per million of CO2. Our own work on airplanes, we see CO2 concentrations uh, during boarding at 3,000, sometimes 4,000 parts per million. So all this to say that the CO2 concentrations we tested are CO2 concentrations that are typically encountered or normally encountered by most of us in many indoor environments. And this is, uh, we think, shocking because for a long time, carbon dioxide is thought to be benign uh, at these low concentrations. It's used as a tracer or uh, as a tool to under a proxy for ventilation rates. But this study, another one out of Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, uh, another one in Europe, is starting to see some indications that there might be direct effects of CO2 at these concentrations. Now, from a practical standpoint, you control CO2 through ventilation. So this is a little bit of an academic question in some ways. Uh, but it's linked with our findings of, of better performance at high ventilation rates and low CO2 concentration. So we've <clears throat> published that paper. By the way, all these papers are available on a, a nice website. I think it comes up later in the slide. Uh, the hashtag up there, that's for the, the Twitter uh, conversation if you want to join that. But it's, the website is thecogeffectstudy.com, just like the hashtag up there, but .com. And it has links to some background on the study team, the study site, our methodology. It has links to all the peer-reviewed papers. Uh, it's an attractive site. It's a one-stop shop for all sorts of information about this study. So after we published that study, we asked an immediate question of ourselves. We knew many others would have it, too, was uh, what is the cost to double ventilation rate? So if you're going to double the ventilation rate, what is the economic cost? And so we modeled uh, this across the entire United States, so we counted for all different climate zones, different building strategies, these commercial office buildings, and we find that the costs are in the order of 10 to $40 per person per year, energy costs. But oftentimes that's where the analysis stops, and we extended this a bit further and said, well, what about if you use energy efficient technologies? And there the costs drop to dollars per person per year, and energy cost to double the ventilation rate. Again, that's often where the uh, analysis stops, but then we added in, well, what's the benefit from our study and others? And we estimate that when we normalize our study population to everyone else who's taken this test, we estimate that the benefits are on the order of six to $7,000 per person per year against costs in the range of 10 to $40 per person per year. Further, this does not take into account even other health co-benefits, so I mentioned we looked at the impact of, of higher ventilation rates on cognitive function, but there's decades of research on the benefits of higher ventilation on things like reductions in absenteeism, uh, lowered infectious disease transmission, um, and reduction in sick building symptoms. So if you factor that into the analysis, it would further uh, uh, skew this in terms of cost versus benefit. And we can talk about the modeling we did, but I think the takeaway is this, any way you model this, it's orders of magnitude, order of magnitude benefit, many orders of magnitude, compared to cost when we think about ventilation. But as I said, we're, we're, uh, we published all this in peer-reviewed uh, papers, and we paid to have them all open access, so you don't need an, a subscription at a university or other to get these papers. They're all available through that website, thecogivexstudy.com, uh, but we're committed to the peer review process, and these are the set of four papers I've been talking about now. And we've been um, pretty pleased, and I mentioned in the beginning that outdoor air pollution gets a lot of attention, and this study has seemed to grab the attention of uh, certainly the real estate community, the business community. Uh, it's nice to see public health and the indoor environment actually uh, mentioned, or this study highlighted in some uh, what we think are really uh, important and big outlets that are reaching a much wider audience than our typical public health circles, where we tend to read each other's work and very little escapes uh, our own little network often. 
And then last, we should update this now, but we've been committed to um, making sure that this uh, research and others uh, gets out of our public health sphere. So we've been presenting uh, everywhere, many times around the world, uh, to different audiences and stakeholders, including government and architects, designers, and scientists, uh, trying to expand the conversation about uh, how the indoor environment impacts our health and actually even more broadly um, uh, the benefits that, uh, that can be obtained through optimizing uh, indoor environments and paying attention to this critical environment. So I'm going to move into study two in a minute, but, you know, as a reminder, the picture on the screen, that's the office environment where we did the work from study one, a right? highly controlled environment. We, we manipulated one variable at a time, keeping everything else constant. But we know, and everybody recognizes this, that the real world is a lot more complex and complicated. So here's um, a picture from one of the buildings in our second study we're going to tell you about. And it's obviously a lot more complex with multiple ventilation zones. You have lighting, different uh, lighting penetration. You have mobile workforce. Um, so the real world complexity uh, we thought was a challenge. We said, well, how do we move our research from the lab to the real world and extend this work into real office buildings across the U.S.? We started thinking, well, how do we do this, or what's our conceptual framing here? And we took some inspiration from what's been happening in the field of genetics in terms of uh, the development of new tools that have allowed us to look at places in the human genome that previously were unavailable to us. Right? For decades, we knew about genes, and that was pretty much the focus of gene-environment interaction. But it's, we're realizing now with these new metagenomic tools that it's a lot more complicated. We can see in the so-called um, non-coding regions of the DNA, well, previously we thought areas that were junk DNA that had no value or benefit or no involvement in um, in these molecular processes, but because of these new tools, we can start to see and understand the complexity of what's happening instead of looking at this one gene at a time approach. And we've been thinking, well, you know, how do we do this for buildings then? We moved from genetic medicine to genomic medicine, the whole new field called epigenomics, the layer essentially that is on top of your DNA in the epigenomics. Uh, we used to look at specific metabolites. Now we, we have metabolomics. We looked at di used to look at uh, different transcription factors. Now we have transcriptomics. We have exposomics. We have proteomics for proteins. And we think that it's time now for what we've been calling buildingomics, this idea that we can go beyond looking at one factor at a time, embrace the complexity of buildings, and start looking for these complex interactions and look at these so-called non-coding regions of the building, places we haven't thought to look before. If you think about, you know, to continue the analogy, buildings have their own DNA, the common DNA pieces, right? They're all essentially constructed, well, in general, very similar. But you have these, you know, epigenomic factors or these other things that are happening in terms of how you uh, spec products in the place, how you operate and maintain the mechanical system, what people bring into the space. And we know that it's a really complex environment, and very often uh, researchers, especially in our field, and we're guilty of this too, is starting to look at one factor at a time. So in this study, we launched study two, was a study of buildings across the United States and what we call our building omics study to examine the complexity of these factors in green buildings specifically with the same outcome in mind. So the impact, again, uh, on cognitive function or human decision-making performance as a proxy for productivity. So at this point, I'll pass it off to uh, Dr. McNaughton here, Beers, and he'll talk about our second study, and then we'll open it up to uh, question and answer. Thanks, Joe. So the big distinction between um, the first study and the second one here was that we went from the lab to the real world. So in that first study that Joe presented, we were in this highly controlled environment. And as Joe said, when you look at the types of buildings we went to in this second study, the complexity really is a lot more um, of an issue than you had in the first study. We can't control all these factors, which is why we need to take that building almost approach. So our goal was to get a really good sample of buildings. We went to five U.S. cities, starting in our hometown of Boston. We worked our way from east to west, um, so ended up in California. And in each city, we uh, recruited two buildings to participate in this study. And 
the goal of our recruitment was to have the two buildings in each, in each city to be as similar to each other as possible, with the key distinction being that one uh, attained green certification while the other did not. So we have them, um, generally we recruited them to have the same, um, same type of workforce, so the same tenant in both buildings. That way we can control for their baseline cognitive function. Um, we also tried to uh, control the, the age of the building and um, the size of the building. So these buildings were, for the most part, pretty similar. I can give you an example. In Boston, we had two buildings that were essentially across from each other in a courtyard, both the same year. The one distinction was that one building was renovated to green while the other was not. Uh, in each building, we recruited uh, up to 12 participants. We had over 100 participants total in our study. And for a week, we would assess the environment and we'd measure all the factors we could think of, lighting, noise, air quality, ventilation. And at the same time, we would track the well-being of our participants. So they would take um, daily surveys and at the same time, they would complete cognitive tests on the Tuesday and Thursday of that week. So when we uh, looked at the environmental data we collected, we actually were a little bit surprised by what we found. So if you look at these box plots here, there's actually a lot of concordance between the two building types, between the non-certified types and the certified buildings shown here. And especially this is the case for the factors we looked at in the first study, so things like CO2, VOC, ventilation rate, a lot of similarity between both building types. Where we do see differences are in relative humidity, so you can see the non-certified buildings are generally more humid. Um, we see the certified buildings are generally louder and also brighter. So these were some of the things we wanted to focus on in the second study. Just to bring up um, those three that I talked about before from the study one, this is where our measured data fell compared to our targets from the previous study. So we can see that um, our, our CO2 concentrations are very low, low, down towards what our low condition was in the first study. Our VOC concentrations are also down towards what we call our green environment, chemical free environment. And the ventilation rates are um, almost up at uh, 40 CFM in some cases. So more towards this higher ventilation rate, higher than what the ASHRAE standard would specify. And there's also a lot of similarities. So when we look at these buildings, we now have started to call them as all high performing. They're all doing well across these um, different factors. And where we see differences are in different types of parameters, things like thermal conditions and lighting. Now for the, the results. Um, despite the fact that they were all high performing for those three factors, we still see these big impacts of people working in the green certified buildings. So we see that the participants in the green certified buildings had 30% fewer sick building symptoms over the week we were there. They also were more satisfied with the environment, so that there were fewer complaints about the temperature, air movement, dryness, um, chemical odors, and also with satisfaction with lighting conditions, both daylight and electrical lighting. But once again, the, the big finding we found was this effect on cognitive function performance. This is the same tool as what we did in the first study. We see once again that there's this big impact on, uh, in this case, seven of the nine domains of cognitive function. On average, the participants in the green certified buildings scored 26% higher than those in the non-certified non buildings. And once again, some of the biggest domains that were impacted were things like crisis response, um, information usage, strategy. Once again, these are the factors that are most closely tied to other measures of productivity, like salary at age and uh, number of people supervised. So once again, we see this big impact on cognitive function. With that in mind, we started to consider what is driving this. We know that the drivers are probably not going to be things like ventilation rate and CO2 because those were consistent between building types. So our question was, what's driving these differences in study two? And one of the things we noticed was this effect of thermal conditions. We found that participants that were within the ASHRAE standard 55 thermal comfort zone, so this is the range of temperatures and humidities in which approximately 80% of occupants will be satisfied. If a participant was in that zone, they were they scored 5.4% higher than participants that weren't within that zone. Um, so we saw that effect of thermal conditions on cognitive function. The second association was with lighting. Remember that the certified buildings were generally brighter than the non-certified buildings. And we know from the literature that uh, lighting conditions can affect our circadian rhythms. So uh, we kind of have an internal clock. And that clock is cued by lighting conditions. And if you have a bigger contrast between your daylighting during the day and your um, lack of lighting at night, that can help you um, entrain your circadian rhythm and help you fall asleep at night. Uh, at the same time, you might have heard how if you use your iPad or iPhone at night, that can help you stay up at night because that um, blue and rich lighting from your phone can 
be delaying the release of melatonin. So it's a similar kind of associated anticipation there. So we saw that in our study, the participants that were in the high-performing high green-certified buildings had this brighter, um, more daylighting environment, and this actually led to them having higher sleep quality scores. So all our participants during the study, they wore this um, smartwatch that tracked their sleep quality by measuring their motion. And um, just looking at the results of those, that sleep data, we saw that their sleep scores improved for the participants in the green certified buildings. Then intuitively, if um, the participant slept better that night, they perform better on the cognitive text the next day. So we see this cyclical effect where people are um, having better daylighting in their buildings, they're sleeping better at night, and then they're performing better at work the next day. So just to tie that all together, we see that there is this um, kind of holistic effect of working in a green building on people's well-being and health, both in terms of their perceptions of the environment and their uh, symptoms that they reported, and most importantly, on cognitive function using this objective um, tool that assesses their cognitive function. We saw that this was primarily driven by thermal comfort and sleep, but um, sleep as through lighting, but there's still more to be explained here, and that goes to the complexity of these environments that um, there's probably other factors that are not quantified here, building level factors they weren't able to assess that could be driving some of the effect we saw. Uh, once again, the range of ventilation rates and of um, chemical concentrations were pretty constant between building types, so we don't really expect there to be much difference there um, caused, caused by those factors. And then also we see that there's this impact after you leave the office. So we're exposed for the eight hours we're there, but not only does that affect us while we're in the office by causing us to have building symptoms, we bring those home with us and they can affect the way that we, we sleep and feel. So uh, I'm going to turn it back to Joe here to wrap up with the last couple slides, um, talking about um, our new program that's focusing on how do we actually collect this data and how do we analyze it, because we know there are all these factors in the built environment that's very complex. Our next step was to characterize these factors and understand what do you do to actually measure them. So Joe's going to wrap up with that. All right, thanks, Piers. So we'll just wrap up in the next few minutes here talking about our research program. Uh, one of the things we've done is we've created what we're calling the nine foundations of a healthy building. So uh, I'll give you another website, not to overdo it here, but uh, our research program at Harvard can be found on the website forhealth.org, F-O-R health.org. And this nine foundations we published this year, and it was in response to some of the feedback we've gotten at uh, presentations like this that we've given over the past year, year and a half, where we talk about our work but also about others in the field of indoor environmental quality, and we kept, kept getting the question, well, what are the key factors that influence health in a building? So we tried to simplify it based on uh, our experience in the field of public health, and prior to joining public health, I was in consulting where I led a division of uh, forensic scientists investigating resolving sick buildings, so I've seen many hundreds of problem buildings, so you know what goes wrong in buildings and then therefore know how to do them right. So we decided to release this. Now on the website you can get some more information on uh, each of these factors, how you can optimize them, uh, and importantly a, com a related component that we released at the same time in response to these questions was, um, you know, the research is great, but I don't have time to read four or six or eight peer-reviewed papers. I need the two-page executive summary. So we started a uh, related program called um, Building Evidence for Health. It's also on our website, and here we create the, these two-page summaries of the scientific literature for each of the nine foundations, and then uh, we're adding two topics per month over the next year on topics that hopefully come from feedback from you and others uh, that we deem are important. So these two-page executive summaries are very simple, straightforward language. What is ventilation? Why does it matter? How do you measure it? What does the science say for how it influences health? And nearly every sentence is cited. So the third page in this executive summary uh, are the full citations back to the primary literature. So we're trying to address that comment that is true. Not many people have time to read the peer-reviewed literature. But these are two-page synthesis for why these different factors matter. And they're all available on our site. And we've added a couple more recently looking at some chemicals of, health, uh, of concern like bromonated flame retardants and polyfluorinated chemicals, these stain repellent chemicals. We hope it's a resource for the building, design, architectural um, community. And the last part in our study, in our website, in our group is that we often get questions, well, how do we actually pull this kind of uh, research off? What kind of equipment do you use? And we have a program I started at Harvard called Sensors for Health. And on our forhealth.org website, 
There's a section on sensors where we talk about our methodology used in this study and elsewhere, or how you go about measuring in real time these different health performance indicators in a building so you can continually or constantly be optimizing uh, for health. So to wrap it up here at the end, you know, we have these two sets of studies, both looking at the impact of green building on cognitive function. Study one was conducted in a lab environment, a highly controlled environment, and we see these dramatic impacts on uh, decision-making performance. Then we went to the real world and real buildings, and again, we see this impact, but beyond these individual uh, parameters, right? We see a building level effect on how people perform. I think a lot of that might be actually intuitive. I think we've all probably experienced good and bad indoor environments and have seen firsthand how it affects our ability to think and perform. I think what's most provocative in what Piers was talking about is that we're starting to see or think or see signs that buildings influence us beyond the few hours we're in them in each day. So think about a home, you're there uh, after work, through the evening, or in some people all day. Uh, for office environments, you know, we're there for typically eight hours a day. But we're starting to see that, that the, how the building's performing, specifically the indoor environment, may impact us later that evening. Uh, we can talk more about the questionnaire, the, air, uh, the question and answer period, but that second to last bullet there, it, it's very clear to me uh, that uh, designing to these code, codes are not enough. In fact, these are the codes or these standards are minimum standards that we're, I think, currently designing to, uh, but we can do better. And last, in our Sensors for Health or our Building Evidence for Health program, we talk about the need to measure in real time these health performance indicators with new uh, sensors that are available so that it's not just one cross-sectional survey, we understand how our spaces are performing, but we're actually monitoring them in real time and reacting to them in real time so that this goal towards uh, improving the lives of all people every day, everywhere in buildings uh, can be accomplished in real time. And we're getting to the point where we can do that. I want to wrap it up uh, here. The website where all of the peer-reviewed papers are are now on the screen. Uh, we invite you to go to that site and uh, look at the more background on the studies or any specific studies that we've mentioned today. I think at this point I'll turn it back over to Brett. We're happy to answer questions or have a discussion for the remaining time we have today. And thank you all for, uh, for joining us. Great, thanks. Yeah, we got uh, plenty of time for questions here. We've got a few questions I see rolling in, uh, but please uh, drop your questions in. Uh, and just real quick before we get to the Q&A, for those of you looking for continuing ed, uh, check your email uh, or uh, spam uh, for a survey that's coming your way on how to report your uh, CEUs to us, as well as get your GVCI number and your official email to uh, validate your attendance. Uh, and even if you don't need CEUs, we appreciate if you take that. Um, for those of you watching the on-demand recorded version, make sure to complete that 10-question quiz there with a 70% passing rate. And real quick, uh, we couldn't do it without you, uh, our listeners, our viewers, our board of directors, our members, um, and our major sponsors, Niagara Conservation, Panasonic Ventilation, uh, Build Equinox with the Serve, and Suntuitive Self-Tinting Glass from Pleotin. Huge thanks to all of our sponsors. All right, so we got some uh, questions coming in. I guess the biggest one is uh, where can people access these studies and um, uh, some of those other materials that you referenced? Are they all at this uh, uh, website right here? Yeah, so um, good question. So uh, the one website's on the screen, thecogeffectstudy.com, and then you can also see more of our research uh, or and the newest research in this space at forhealth.org. It's not on the screen, but it's forhealth.org. And that's uh, our Healthy Buildings Research Program at Harvard where we talk about uh, this kind of research. And we have some resources available to you on that site too, like our Building Evidence for Health Program. These are all free, downloadable PDFs about the nine foundations of a healthy building and several other topics related to a uh, healthy building. Great, so the first question we got from Ty, uh, within the building study, are you able to examine microclimate differences for the occupants? That is, within green buildings and conventional buildings, do results show similar cognition, cognition differences between the good slash poor building regions? 
Yeah, so I'll start and then Pierce will jump in, but that's a really good question. And we think this is, uh, we know this is one of the advantages of, uh, of being able to u utilize these new sensor technologies is that we do measure these different microenvironments. So we're measuring uh, at the desk of each participant. And, um, and we also have them wear these watches. Uh, so we're measuring right on the person where they spend their time. And even in that first study we mentioned, which is the lab controlled environment, and we measured CO2. Uh, at each cubicle. So we're talking about a relatively small room uh, where we measured CO2 and we were controlling CO2 for the space. And if you look at, think about that one graph I showed with the carbon dioxide concentrations, even within the range we targeted, so we targeted 950 parts per million, you saw in one room a range from about 800 up to, you know, uh, 1,100 parts per million of CO2 just in one room with us controlling it. So there's absolutely no question that these microenvironments exist even within a, a room. Uh, and this is something we look for and control for. So all of our analyses control for these differences as the question asks in microclimates or microenvironments. We track this closely and carefully and it's included in our analysis. Yeah, it's, it's important to note that we're pairing up the, the outcome data, things like the survey results or the cognitive test results with the measurements that were taken in that person's cubicle. So everyone's being associated with their own environment rather than some average environment for the building. Great, thanks. Um, the other question, uh, and maybe it needs elaboration, I'm not sure, but uh, what chemicals are confirmed for linkage of low cognitive function? Yeah, so that's a great question, and I'll tell you how we did it in the study and why. Um, is we looked at a we kept it as a class of chemicals intentionally. So the class of chemicals are volatile organics, and v or VOCs, and we purposely uh, raised the concentration of VOCs in our uh, first study in that chamber or the, the simulated office environment to uh, a VOC concentration based on uh, green or LEED credits. So a green certification system administered by the U.S. Green Building Council. They use LEED. You can get credits for having a low VOC environment if you are under 500 micrograms per cubic meter, so an airborne concentration of total VOCs less than that. So we intentionally uh, kept it as a class. We introduced a mix of common VOCs, common uh, VOCs emitted from office products specifically, and we tested against that threshold. So we said, what happens if you're above 500 micrograms per cubic meter of TVOCs or total VOCs against lower, and actually when we tested low, it was, uh, in the, it was very low, 50 to 100 microgram per cubic meter. So the question's good. I think this study wasn't designed to answer which specific chemicals. In fact, it was designed to assess a complex mixture of common VOC chemicals. And just to speak to how we actually did that in the study, instead of introducing the chemicals themselves, we introduced the products you'd expect in that space. So we put things like dry clean clothing and um, adhesives, office supplies, cleaners, the type of products that you'd expect to find in a space. So we're looking more at that common type of mixture as opposed to individual chemicals. The chemicals we sampled for is a set of around 60 volatile organic compounds that we can sample for with our SUMA canisters. But once again, it's very difficult to correlate any one of those chemicals you measured with uh, the outcomes. Is there any reason why um, microbial is not addressed? Yeah, that's a really good question. When we do a lot of uh, microbiome work and microbiome studies looking at um, uh, the impact of microbial communities, both uh, internal and external to humans. So we look at upper respiratory microbiome, we look at gut microbiome, we look at indoor and outdoor environmental microbiome. Uh, so in this study, we really want to, I mean, there's a, we'd love to test all of these factors. So in the, in the controlled environment, we certainly looked, we, we manipulated three variables that were highly plausible, or we had hypothesized that they would be related to cognitive function. I haven't seen uh, strong literature, at least on microbiome studies, that link the microbiome with cognitive function. I like the idea. Uh, and, you know, I think in the rest of our assessment, we covered just about everything else you would want to measure in terms of environmental health, but we didn't measure for uh, any uh, uh, microbes, either airborne or, uh, or in the dust. Okay, great. Uh, this question is kind of getting into some, uh, uh, I guess you could say, prescriptive approaches to uh, solutions. And I'm not sure, uh, I guess I, we'll, we'll throw it out there. Would installing a grill above doors in multifamily buildings help buildings 
that only have exhaust fans in the bathroom atmospheric. Uh, the, common, the common hallways are unheated, but the bottom of the doors are sealed or, for example, not undercut at the bottom. Do you, do you I guess, based on what you've seen on uh, recommendations to make improvements, does that uh, sound like something that could be done? Well, so I, I think you have to think about what you're adding and why and what you're trying to address, right? So in uh, many buildings, so I actually should say, when we talk about higher ventilation rates first, uh, it's under the assumption that the air you're bringing in from outdoor is clean, right? So in many locations, I think of uh, Beijing, for example, if you're increasing the ventilation rate without controlling particles, well, that's not going to lead to a good indoor environment. So I should have stated that during the presentation. It comes with that assumption. Uh, second, so if you're going to include any kind of filtration or uh, if I'm hearing that question right, uh, you know, filters, uh, most common filters uh, are, are trapping particulate, right? So we're talking about sometimes, so that's important, um, but, you know, you're, you're not capturing gaseous pollutants, so you think about VOCs, well, that's really not going to do uh, much for the VOC concentrations not impacting the carbon dioxide concentrations that we were talking about today. You're not really talking about the overall ventilation rate. So, yeah, there, there are definitely, uh, you know, I'm a proponent or a fan of using uh, even portable air purifiers in locations where you could have high indoor particle concentrations. They work, they're effective, they can reduce uh, PM2.5 concentrations if you're near the road or if outdoor levels uh, are pen or particles penetrate indoors, certainly. So they're effective. So I think when we, anytime we talk about filtration and the benefits, it's just we have to think about what we're guarding against and be sure that we're, uh, I think, often a misconception that if you put in a filter, it solves everything. Yeah, right, absolutely. And, and if I can take a, a quick shot at this, not to get too down the rabbit hole as we have other resources on, on ventilation strategies, but uh, um, you know, overall, we do want to have a uh, 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 what we call compartmentalization in the units. Um, so we want to have all the units sealed off. So you know, putting in uh, uh, grills to the outdoor common area is isn't really a good idea. Um, and so yeah, you're talking about an exhaust-only strategy with the bath fan. Um, but there are devices, for example, like uh, you know, Panasonic. They make small ERVs that can be integrated right into the existing unit and they can bring in that fresh air, um, filter air, and, and, and basically have a balanced, balanced system. But I don't, I don't want to go uh, too far down the one with that. I just wanted to put that thought out there as well. So the other uh, questions coming in here are, what are your thoughts of enhancing the impact of regulatory agencies beyond developing code to encourage and increase green certified buildings with COG findings implemented in real and practical applications? Yeah, that's a really good question. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time talking about these ASHRAE standards, and people ask me, well, why aren't you getting involved with ASHRAE? I, I think the process for me is too slow. Uh, you know, I often talk about the ASHRAE standard we're talking about for ventilation is called the Standard for Acceptable Indoor Air Quality. And that's the word they use. They use acceptable. It's a minimum standard by definition. It's not, it's not the standard for healthy indoor air quality. So to their credit, they've defined it and set their standards for what they're targeting. The problem is, is I think we've taken it and said, well, that's the standard. Let's meet it, when in fact it's a minimum standard, and ASHRAE calls it a minimum standard too. So uh, we're not going far enough. I, I think it's too um, slow for me, that process. I think uh, the mission we're on is one that's market driven. So we're trying to get the we're trying to get the public health science into the hands of people like people on this call and other decision makers in the real estate community to say, uh, you know, here's the evidence for why things like ventilation matter. And actually, it's going to provide a benefit to your uh, employee or uh, occupant health. Uh, we've demonstrated that that's a 90% cost of operating your business. And if you can even reduce absenteeism or presenteeism or uh, uh, keep employees longer. This has an immediate and big impact on the bottom line. So the way we're approaching this is trying to get the good uh, public health science into the hands of decision makers who can make better decisions and change the cost-benefit analysis that's happening right now, where it's entirely driven by energy. And energy conservation clearly is very important, right? But it can't come at the cost of human health. So this is where we're at now, and this is the way uh, we're operating. Although I know many good people, many good scientists and engineers are doing work through these code-setting bodies and standard-setting bodies, but uh, for me personally, it's just not um, it's not where I see being the, the path to uh, greatest impact in the shortest amount of time. 
So to, to keep with that, that conversation again, uh, you're saying even besides codes, um, uh, even, even, even programs, like let's just take lead since it's the most internationally recognized. You're saying the recommendations coming out of that, both for new construction and uh, major renovations, aren't keeping up with the pace, uh, maybe fast enough to where we need other resources for guidance. Would that be, would that be accurate? Yeah, I think, you know, when we look at the, the lead data, for example, I'm always surprised, and we see that only 40 or 30 percent, 40 percent of projects pursue this enhanced ventilation credit. You can get a credit for enhancing ventilation, and very few people do, and I think that's probably for obvious reasons, because they're motivated by the energy cost. But the conversation around green buildings is changing towards health. It, that is undoubtedly happening. And uh, business owners, and more importantly, um, uh, the consumers are getting wise to how the buildings are impacting their health. So I think this will come from a demand side question, too. I think, uh, you know, the credits exist. I just don't think they're being chased right now, um, probably because the, the benefit argument hasn't been made clearly enough. And that's totally our fault. That's public health's fault. When I talk about a richness in literature, I'm talking about decades, 30 years of science showing the benefits of higher ventilation rates. And then when I sit in on some of these meetings, um, I hear people surprised to hear that. And I think, well, you know, we take it for granted in public health, but we're, all, we're talking to each other over here, and that's, a, that's our fault. That's our failing. It's a, it's a big problem because the evidence is very clear, and if you want to know more about it, uh, and not just a plug, but go, go look at that Nine Foundations document. Find the two-pager on ventilation, and it has links to all the science or uh, that sh the studies that show that when you enhance these ventilation rates, you, see these, uh, you can see these benefits. Um, lots of great questions pouring in here. Uh, this is fantastic. Keep asking more. We got some more time. Um, getting back to the study, in earlier studies, occupants indicated acoustics and noise as the most major impediments to predictivity. What was the order of effect of the nine conditions in your study? So that's an interesting question, and um, so I'll try and clarify a couple things here. One is, you know, it's interesting in, in the, that review paper, uh, you know, Green Buildings and Health. We looked at uh, the, the publications uh, in this area, and it's for most indoor environmental quality factors, people report better satisfaction, except for noise. So it's either even or maybe slightly less. So it's, I think that's a common, or at least we see it in the literature, it's a common uh, issue related to noise. We did not assess the impact of noise in our studies. Not that we, we did measure it, and we controlled for it in our analyses, but it's not something we manipulated to test um, the effect of. And that last part of the question about what's the rank order, I, I hope I didn't confuse it too much. So the nine foundations is more broad than the studies we talked about. These are just the, the nine foundations or what we think are foundational factors related to a healthy building. We didn't test all of those in our study, right? Th that comes from, um, you know, a decade of, uh, of practice and uh, education, I mean, professional practice and education on uh, seeing sick buildings and understanding what the science says about all these other factors. So, for example, we've done a lot of work on chemicals and health or chemicals that reside in dust. But that wasn't a focus of this study. So we, don't, we didn't test all nine foundations in this study. But the nine foundations is grounded on the entire body of scientific research around healthy buildings, way beyond uh, this one study or set of studies. Great. Yeah, so as I suspected, um, a lot of questions pouring in uh, focused on the uh, residential built environment. Um, obviously, your, your study seemed to mostly foc focus on, um, on commercial spaces and, um, you know, employee performance. Um, but, I, but I would say with, with more people, uh, more and more people starting to, to work from home, I'm personally calling in from my house right now. I do a lot of work from my house. Uh, both in uh, single-family homes and working from home in apartment situations. Um, what, um, you know, what are you seeing out there uh, for, for these types of studies on uh, improving performance for people in residential applications, uh, what, you know, whether they're just working from home in their own businesses or whether they spend part of their time from a, a, a corporate business world and maybe having the corporations looking into actually improving the health of people's homes as one of their benefits, if you will. Um, and I know that's kind of a loaded question, but I guess speak to me a little bit about, um, you know, residential applications when it comes to improving performance from people who, who work from home. 
Yeah, that's another great question, and uh, I guess I'm not surprised to the audience. I should have done a better job of weaving this in a bit more, but you know, if we're essentially talking about fundamental principles here, right? So there's no reason to suspect that what we see, the impacts on ventilation rates on human performance are different uh, in these different environments, a school, a home, an office, a hospital. So that's one. I think the the other the bigger question is probably you know are are these always environments where you want to be um, you know highly productive and stimulated right so maybe you're working from home today sure you're you're working but you know when I get home tonight uh, I usually do the other thing right I'll have a glass of wine or something and and I'm trying to relax so it's not the time I want to be ultra productive um, so you know it, it, what matters here is what you're trying to achieve in each uh, in each spot. Um, you know, Piers talked about the impact of lighting that we saw during the workday. So we know that the circadian rhythm uh, is uh, obviously critically important, but it's influenced by the amount of uh, or the, the amount of type of light you get. So you can think about adjusting these kind of factors in the home uh, at night and during the day as well. Um, and you know, we do a lot of research and others too on home environments specifically, focused on. Um, more of the things I think that are uh, that are maybe more critical at home, uh, in addition to productivity, right? Things like uh, allergen loads in the dust or um, sources of uh, persistent endocrine disrupting chemicals that you bring into the home through, uh, say, flame retardant chemicals that are in your couch or plasticizers that are in products you bring into your home. So it's a bit of a different, uh, at least our work and others, it's a bit of a different focus and really hasn't been the subject of studies focusing on productivity. I think that's probably intuitive, right, that most of the research on productivity in indoor environments has come in studies that focus on uh, commercial office buildings or hospitals, uh, airplanes, right, these kind of uh, microenvironments, and less so on the home, where the home is Home studies are more focused on uh, potential hazards in the home, like these persistent chemicals uh, or other you know, or allergens in the home. Yeah, and just to speak to the building evidence for health documents, those aren't really geared like this presentation was to just um, commercial settings. Those are geared to kind of all all settings. They're really apl applicable to any type of population, whether it's residential, commercial, or otherwise. So you'll find guidance there, not just on productivity, but the impacts that these different foundations can have on other metrics of health outside of productivity. Great, thanks. And yeah, we, we do have some uh, some technical questions uh, pouring in here on, on ventilation standards and rates and ideas for residential structures. So I, I do highly encourage everyone listening in to uh, check out our YouTube channel or if you're USGBC members, checking out our, our USGBC channel. Uh, we have uh, lots of sessions based on ventilation. Uh, we've got some great ones coming up with our um, sponsors, Build Equinox, that really get into the, some of the technical details on, on what to do. Um, one other question I have in here uh, that could, you know, be relevant to the home or, or you know, any space that might have uh, uh, cooking operations would be, uh, will you or are you studying the impact of nitrogen oxides on cognition, for example, gas cooking? So we are, we are not, we didn't include it in our uh, cognitive function test, but our group and research, broad, more broad research group of faculty here have done a lot of work on looking at the impact of uh, nitrogen, oxi nitrogen oxides from cooking indoors, and it's a known respiratory irritant, right? So there's been a lot, of, lot done on here, uh, particularly in relation to asthma exacerbation, um, but it's not something, right, we're not looking at it in terms of productivity, uh, and I'm not sure it's addressed in our little in our occupation in our um, building evidence for health documents, but it gives me an idea. That's why we like doing these presentations. It gives me an idea that um, I think what we'll do is we'll put one of our students on this to create kind of a two-page executive summary on on uh, indoor cooking and how, and uh, what are the concerns and how you might address it. Because it's a good idea of uh, information we could put out there. Because again, this is another topic where you know uh, whoever asked the question, there's got to be. I don't know, 20 or 30 peer-reviewed papers that focus on that topic, not on productivity outcomes, but on other health outcomes. So again, I think the, uh, there's a richness to the, to the scientific literature that uh, you know, I think we can do a better job of synthesizing and get it into your hands. Yeah, great. And one of the comments that came in is you know, cul culinary employees working in restaurants with, with high, uh, high usage of uh, natural gas and um, you know, it reminds me of one thing we're talking to folks about uh, when they're trying to get to zero energy, it's uh, induction 
is seems to be induction stoves are one way to eliminate that issue uh, and also significantly uh, reduce energy. But, uh, yeah, that's a good comment. You think more broadly too, that's a really smart comment that, um, you know, I'm a certified industrial hygienist. I do a lot of work on occupational health issues and very often where you see the most susceptible populations or most at-risk populations of the workforce. So there, this is where we learn of uh, effects before, uh, you know, at high, at high exposures that, that happen all the time, just such like the example here of a, a culinary worker, uh, you know, where you know, maybe we have more transient exposures, but someone who's working in a professional uh, kitchen might have constant exposure for entire work days, day after day after day, year after year. Really good comment. Um, so, obviously, there there is uh, you know building design operations infrastructure, um, but what about um, just general habits of people and how uh, that can play a role? Um, you know, I know when I look at programs like LEED or other green building programs, they try to to the best that they can go beyond just the uh, um, HVAC systems or, or other systems installed, and and also look at the you know, training people to operate those systems correctly, but what what can you speak to a little bit about um, about habits in regards to these I impacts? Yeah, well, so a couple things that I think are important. You hit on two there, and I, the related one is, um, you know, how, how how people use the space is different than often how it's designed for, right? And what really matters is what people bring into the space, particularly think about VOCs and other chemicals. So. Someone brings a chair to their office that's different, or they're wearing perfume or cologne or one of these uh, scent uh, or air fresheners, right? So people are going to have a big impact on the environment. Also, CO2, I mean, CO2 is driven by people, right? So it's, it's density of the space, how, you know, if a, if a space is designed for a particular density and the occupant decides to cram more people into that space, well, that's going to have an impact on disease transmission and, and pollutant buildup, absolutely. The other part of the question you mentioned I think is important, too, is, very often we, we stop at the design stage and uh, we forget about uh, maintenance and operation. So again, buildings are designed certain ways. You put up a cubicle wall and all of a sudden that airflow changes in that space. Uh, doing these building investigations I've done for many years, uh, I can't tell you the number of times we've just seen simple mistakes too, a filter installed backwards. And so, you know, it, I, I like to say that the most important person for your health is not your doctor but it's the facilities manager in your building. So if you have somebody who's good and they're on their game and they're maintaining and operating the systems as designed, that person's gonna have a bigger impact on your health than even your primary care physician. Because this person's controlling where you spend all of your time uh, and determining how healthy your indoor environment is. So you could design the best building in the world but if it's not maintained and operated correctly, uh, it, it really means nothing. Great, thanks. Um, and and one, uh, one more question here before we wrap up that seems to be uh, diving into uh, uh, carbon monoxide monitoring, and maybe you covered it, but maybe you could go back over it again. Um, through the assumption is high efficiency appliances, is anybody monitoring? Uh, oh, uh, well this actually is, any, is anyone monitoring uh, carbon monoxide with, with fresh air systems? Maybe they meant CO2, but I do I do see just the CO there. Um, but but maybe you can help answer that. Yeah, no, I think CO is. I, I, I maybe I'll assume it's a question about CO, carbon monoxide. I mean, this is uh, well, in many states it's it's mandatory, right, in residential settings that you're monitoring for this. We have a combustion appliance or um, so or natural or gas. So. Um, yeah, I mean, this is something we measure actually in every single one of our field studies. So there's a lot we didn't talk about what we measure. We measure for particles and metals and semi-volatile compounds and noise and light, uh, and we always measure uh, for carbon monoxide, right? And actually, in all my uh, forensic investigations, we measured carbon monoxide too because, well, I think it's probably obvious why, but um, something goes wrong there. You're talking about severe acute uh, effects uh, rather than the uh, subchronic, subclinical effects we're talking about here. All right, great, thanks. Well, I want to thank all of you for uh, joining us today. I want to thank uh, Pierce and Joseph for your time and putting this on. Um, just real quick, where can people find out more information if they need it? And if they want to have further information, is there anyone that they can contact and, and reach out to? 
Yeah, thanks so much for inviting us, Brad. Thanks for everyone who stayed on the line. I, uh, personally, I like the question answer the best, and, and uh, I like to hear the types of questions that form our future research questions. So this is really helpful for us, too. So I want to thank everybody. Uh, we think see this as a dialogue more than a question and answer or presentation. Uh, and like I said, that website is up there. You're, you're happy to reach out to me if you just Google uh, my name, Joseph Allen, and Harvard. You can see my contact information. Uh, and that best resource for our research is that forhealth.org website, forhealth.org. So thanks, everybody. Enjoyed the conversation. All right. Thank you. Have a great week, everyone. Take care.